Uh, so, uh, please, if possible, do the homework and find out the link, linkage between these purely physical features and sensor parameters. Try to think in a way how to link this. Yeah? Why? Why? Nanobelt, most in three from this location, is good for sensor design. This is the proper way of thinking. Other reasons why, why ZNO nanobelts and nano wires are so promising, also nano rows, is that size and shape can be easily controlled. So it means that it's very conducive for optimization because we can manipulate size and shape. Every, it's always good if the technological process is under control. Yeah? Flexibility and robustness, very high and simple and cheap deposition techniques. I know that you don't like this term cheap, so it should be low cost. Yeah? So this is the future. ZNO is definitely the future material. It's good that you are working on zinc oxide. Very good. Now, the next group of materials are conductive polymers. And we already, we already said that semiconducting metal oxides are operating at elevated temperature. Yeah? Above 300 sometimes up to 600. So it means that there is a power consumption. We don't like if the sensor consumes power. Conductive polymers, but semiconducting metal oxides are highly sensitive to gases and vapors. Conductive polymers could operate at room temperature. So power consumption is low. But their sensitivity toward gases and vapors is not as good, is not as high as for, yeah, as for semiconducting metal oxides. Among different po conductive polymers, because there are several of them have been developed, polyanilin, um, uh, polythiophene, pan? Polypyrrhon. Yeah, several others. Among them, uh, uh, polyanilin was and is most widely uh, researched. And why? Why? Because polyanilin offers rich structural modification chemistry. So chemists know how to modify the properties of this conductive polymer. Room temperature operation. This is very important. Feature. Professor Kanner from UCLA, he found that gas sensitivity is independent on layer thickness. Of course, to some limit, because we cannot say that speculating, you know, uh, uh, counting on your sense of humor, that one meter, one meter thick polyanin layer will have the same gas sensitivity like 100 nanometers. But in a certain range, gas sensitivity is not dependent on a layer thickness, which is very important from future commercialization point of view, because there will be no, no let's say, crucial uh, limitations for the fabrication process. Ease of deposition and low fabrication cost. Here we have a TM image of polyaline polyamine nanofibers. What is the beauty of, so this again, they are chaotically distributed. What is the uh, beauty of this polymer? 
that polyanilin exists in many oxidation states. Many oxidation states. And uh, collaborating with chemists, we can select the proper oxidation state. One of them is uh, emeraldine. Emeraldine is one of the best for gas and vapor sensing. Emeraldine, we can easily, emeraldine exists in, in insulation state, put as a base, emeraldine base, and could exist as a conductor, as an emeraldine salt. And it is easy to switch between both states using the proper acid or other chemicals to come back to the previous state. So it will translate into the sensor conductivity. And again, gas sensitivity for emerald in existing in these two states is different. So we have uh, opportunities to uh, manipulate the value of a initial uh, conductivity. And as, as, as you remember, once I asked what's the best resistance to measure from engineering point of view, and we came to the conclusion that between 100 ohms and 1 kilo ohm, yeah? Molybdenum trioxide, beautiful gas sensing material, but the initial resistance is in the range of tens of mega ohms, even higher. This is the biggest disadvantage. Polyan polyanilin in the uh, form of emeraldine is very conducive. We can switch between between two states, insulator, conductor, conductor <coughs> using protonation, the protonation, this is organic chemistry. Insulating and conductive form. Now, as you remember, I said that people are combining both, both materials, taking the best from them. It means that taking the best, the best for semiconducting metal oxides is high sensitivity. The best from conductive polymers is a possibility to operate at room temperature. So designing composite materials, for instance, polyanilin trioxide, yeah. As a result, we have a highly sensitive material operating at room temperature. Power consumption will be low. The biggest disadvantage of conductive polymers is their poor long-term stability because of a degradation process. But I am optimistic. I tell you why. Because at very early stage of semiconductor industry, germanium was used. That's right. Nobody was thinking about silicon. And uh, slowly, Germ germanium was replaced by silicon, by silicon. But at the very early stage of silicon industry, people were saying, well, some people who were previously used like, vacuum tubes, because the early stage of now you can see it see them in museums, vacuum tubes, yeah? People are saying, well, silicon is a one good material, maybe, but there are three cases that never will be, rep vacuum tubes will be never replaced by silicon. They were saying high power devices, they were saying high frequency devices, and something else. And look what's the situation. Who remembers vacuum tubes today? Nobody. Young generation never heard about vacuum tubes. That's right. Silicon is used widely. The same, why? Because American army injected billions of dollars into silicon physics understanding. And this understanding is very deep. So as a result, as a result, we are able to Com manufacture numerous devices based on silicon. 
yeah? Numerous devices. Similar story could be with, compo with conductive polymers. If more people will work on this, they will spend more money, more time, we can get very good long-term stability. That's right? So let's be positive. This, compo this particular composite uh, material, the aim was to get SEMO semiconducting metal oxide sensitivity operating at room temperature. And we obtained nanobelts, nanobelts. This, this job was done with UCLA, Professor Kanner from UCLA, uh, a few years ago. SEM and TM image of nanofibers. Again, we deposited them on lithium niobate substrate with the view of employing surface acoustic wave transducer. And the results were very good. I will show you. Now, the same uh, XRT result. XRT result. We have a uh, XRD. And this is a composite material. And when we examine separately these two materials, the coincidence, the location of these two peaks is at the same, is the same location. So this is the best evidence that uh, indium trioxide is present in this composite. Here we have a different uh, composite material. There is a TM image of polyamine taxon trioxide nanofibers. Again, very promising uh, composite materials. We can design numerous composite materials combining these two classes. Carbon nanotubes. Carbon nanotubes. They first report on carbon nanotubes. Uh, multi walled carbon nanotubes was uh, delivered by IGMA in Nature in 1991. So, it's a 22 years ago. 22 years ago. Why we are so much, why gas sensing people are so much interested in carbon nanotubes? Because they have a hollow structures. Hollow structures. So, gas diffusion. Gas permeability, the structure permeability to gas is high, high surface to volume ratio, and we can get, we can get not only a very good sensitivity towards several uh, vapors or gases, but also we can get very good uh, very good long term stability, very, sorry, very good dynamic performance, very good dynamic performance because of its hollow structure, hollow structure. Also very good long-term stability because this material is chemically inert and chemistry of this material is well understood so we can obtain the right material. Now, two years later, Ijima reported in Nature again single wall carbon nanotubes. Single wall nanotubes. Nanotubes. Now, here you have a SEM image of this single wall carbon nanotubes obtained by Langmuir Blodgett, the position technique. It's a nice, nice morphology. Why they are so convenient for us? Again. This, this discovery was related to this famous Richard Feynman statement in 1959, which we already know, that uh, why carbon nanotubes are so conducive? We already know, high surface area up to 1,500 square meters per gram, room temperature operation, however, they can operate at elevated temperature, Two, high mechanical and chemical stability, electronic properties ranging from metallic to semiconducting, and very well established functionalization techniques. 
And the beauty of this material is that it's commercially available. You can buy it. You can buy it. There's no need, no reason to synthesize this in, in the laboratory. You can buy it and buy it. Now, numerous sensors were already developed based on this CNT for volatile organic compounds, nitrogen dioxide, ammonia, hydrogen sensor. Very promising material. And the last is graphene. Last is graphene, but I tell you something. Graphene has enormous potential. Enormous potential. But let me tell you something. When I, when I have discussion with American scientists, graphene has one big disadvantage. People in a, let's say, in a informal discussions, they are calling graphene that this is, they, they are saying, is a semi-metal, semiconductor. Is a, the, graphene has no band gap. Graphene has no band gap. For many reasons, it's a disadvantage. And people now, people now, are not as enthusiastic to graphene. People who are working nowadays on graphene, they are not as enthusiastic to graphene as to other materials. Because, first, many people are coming back to carbon nanotubes carbon nanotubes. Recently, it was reported in Nature that graphene is not the end of the story. There are also other materials. You can deposit monoatomic layer. You can obtain monoatomic layer. And they are also very promising. So, seems to be that graphene discovery opened the completely new chapter and very soon we will observe according to my knowledge and information very soon we will observe novel materials as attractive as graphene so plenty of work to do for young generation life could be very exciting carbon nanotubes carbon nanotubes now so we have a, some, uh, some overview of major groups of nanotechnology-enabled materials, which could be combined with different transducers. And now we will discuss briefly trans different type of transducers. And we will discuss how to combine. Because we have many opportunities, depending on the sensing task. When we are considering the situation in the real world, having knowledge on nanomaterials and having knowledge on transducers, we can co make a well-informed decision. What does it mean? I can select the right nanomaterial and the right transducers through many from many options, I can combine them and I can examine sensing properties if it's convenient for this particular sensing task. So let's start from conductometry. Conductometry. As I said, almost all commercialized gas sensors present at the market at this stage are based on conductometric transducers. So this transducer is most commonly used for research and development and commercial purposes. Advantages. Small dimensions, low cost, low power consumption, online operation, it could be used for continuous measurement, and Compatibility with microelectronics processing. In some cases, this is, this is very important if the signal processing system is, is needed. 
Now, the most widely used structures. Polish stru substrate. Polish sapphire with platinum electron beam evaporated electrodes and heater. The next one, we are using quartz with gold electron beam evaporated electrodes and heater. And uh, alumina with platinum spatter or palladium screen printed electrodes and heater. I will show you the structure in a second. If we look at this Polish sapphire and alumina, it's the same chemical formula. So what's the difference between them? Who will help me? The first glass is the same material, but it is not. What is the difference? The basic knowledge from material science is needed. We are after coffee break. Who will help me? Who will help me? Pardon? Order. The arrangement of the, of the atoms. Sapphire is crystalline. It's single, is correct. Single crystalline. Single crystalline, correct. You know, this is the power of physics. That's right. Power of physics. Single crystalline and polycrystalline. That's right. So this is the difference. Chemical formula is the same. We can use this substrate to design conductometric transducer. So how does it look? Look, this is a conductometric transducer. Top, top. We have this interdigital comb structure deposited on the top. Made from platinum, gold, or palladium, depending on the substrates, using standard microtechnology fabrication process. Backside, backside, we have a heater, heater. So we can heat the transducer's structure, and we can obtain homogeneous distribution of temperature. Why is so useful? Because we can optimize the operational temperature. We can, we can uh, measure, we can get a graph, sensitivity versus temperature. We can say for this particular arrangement, with this particular sensing material, the optimum operational temperature is 280 degrees centigrade. This is well informed. Result. Yeah, so this step is necessary to do in order with in order to deal with conductometric uh, transducer combined with certain nanomaterial. Now if there is no heater on the backside for some reasons, you can use thermocouple, thermocouple, and you can measure temperature in a gas chamber. Japanese scientists are not using heater at all. They are using small volume chamber, gas chamber. I mean, heater is not integrated. I mean, they are using heater, but the heater is uh, separated from the structure and measuring temperature by thermocouple. That's right. That's what they are doing. Integration is, is usually done for commercially available commercial sensors. This is the structure. This is a mask used to fabricate the alumina-based transducer, heater left, and electrodes top right. Uh, we have to calibrate the heater, if exists, on the back side. So we have a calibration card. And in general, most of these transducers are mechanically, thermally, and electrically stable and operational to, 
up temperature is up to 600 degrees centigrade. 600 degrees centigrade. But they are special designs that could operate even to 800. So why is it so important? Because you have to have in mind that when I am depositing any sort of nanomaterial, I have to understand that deposition temperature cannot exceed the limits, operational temperature limits of the transducer itself. <laughs> itself. Now, fabrication. Let's come back. Fabrication is a standard microtechnology fabrication. You have a diagram, diagram for this. We can we can use two approaches. Uh, this is a we are using so-called resists. We are covering certain parts with light sensitive polymers. And when this is influenced to when resist is influenced to UV light, it can remove unwanted parts and as a result as a result we can get nice comb interdigital structure on the top and heater structure on the on the back so this is standard approach this is nothing uh, nothing difficult nothing difficult now what is the biggest disadvantage of this transducers the biggest disadvantage is that their power consumption is relatively high. Commercially available Taguchi sensor has a power consumption up to 700 milliwatts. 700 milliwatts. So when we are going to conduct multi-spot, multi-point measurement, when we have to use many, many single single sensors, the total power consumption is relatively high. We are not happy with this. So as a result, people developed, people developed a special sort of conductometric transducer, which is micro machine transducer, low power consumption transducer. So in this case, this is a silicon substrate. Anisotropic etching was used, so you can etch the membrane, membrane, 